Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tech Reunions 2020. Thank you so much for joining us virtually at MIT. My name is Alyssa Holland, and I'm the Associate Director for Student and Alumni Relations at the MIT Alumni Association. It's my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Kate Brown. Kate Brown is a professor of science, technology, and society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is the author of several prize-winning histories, including Plutopia, Nuclear Families in Atomic Cities, and the Great Soviet and American Plutonium Disasters. Her latest book, Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl Guide to the Future, translated into nine languages, was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Critics Circle Award. Before we get started, I do want to point out that we will have time saved at the end of our session for a Q&A. That said, I encourage everyone to put in their questions in the Q&A box as Kate presents. Without further ado, welcome Professor Brown. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, um, but now I don't see the button for that. Um, oh, here we go. Let me just get this going. Uh, so thank you for joining us today, those of you who are out there. This is um, a new experience for us all to lecture on Zoom. Um, but I want to talk today about uh, this book I published last year called A Manual for Survival. And um, lately I've been getting a lot of phone calls from journalists asking me, you know, how is the pandemic like Chernobyl? And um, most of the journalists are thinking about uh, leadership and uh, truth telling. And, and what we see is that in the face of a public health disaster, some leaders first instinct is to downplay and minimize the risk because they fear public hysteria. They basically don't trust their citizens. And, and we see that in the Soviet uh, uh, response to the Chernobyl accident. And we saw that in China this past winter. And, and the American administration, too, has been downplaying the disasters, at, at least at first. Um, but I think there are other connections we also see between the pandemic and Chernobyl. One day this spring, we woke up and realized our surroundings were potential vectors of contagion. Overnight, our worlds became strange and alienating. And because we cannot see this hazard, you can't see radioactive isotopes nor a virus, it becomes hard to know what and whom to believe. Um, the certainties of our former world crumble. And so I think in many ways, now we have a better ability to understand an accident like Chernobyl. And, and in some ways, looking at the accident like Chernobyl helps us get a better grasp on what's going on right now during this pandemic. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about this accident. It occurred April 26, 1986 in uh, the Ukrainian Republic of the Soviet Union. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant, uh, reactor number four, blew up and then it exploded again, releasing between 50 and 200 curies of radioactive isotopes. And I don't think I need to tell this audience that that's an awful lot of destructive energy. Uh, within 36 hours, Soviet leaders had created a, a, drawn basically a circle around the plant and created what they called the zone of alienation. Over the next couple of weeks, they uh, resettled 120,000 people from their homes. Um, and we hear a lot of dramatic stories about the Chernobyl accident. And maybe some of you saw the, the HBO show that came out last spring. But I found as I looked, started researching the story in, in 2014 that we know very little about the aftermath, what the consequences of these, this accident was. Like, how many people died? How many people got sick? And, and what did they get sick of? These questions are, are very much disputed. And so I figured I would do what historians do. I would go to the archives and, and figure out what I can. And so I went to Kiev first and I walked into the archive and I said, you know, I'd like the, the files from the Ministry of Health on the Chernobyl accident. And the women there laughed at me. They said, you know, this was a, a, a banned, censored topic during the Soviet Union. You're not gonna find anything in the records. I said, well, let's just take a look. And, and we did it. And it didn't take a good 
great sleuth. Within a couple of minutes, we found whole uh, document, bound document collections labeled in plain Ukrainian, the Chernobyl, uh, the medical consequences of the Chernobyl disaster. I started reading those files and I was blown away by what I found. And uh, I, I, was, I was so concerned by what I was finding that I, I figured I, I couldn't be wrong. And so I ended up uh, going to other archives uh, all the way, I worked my way down to the county archives. I worked my way up to the federal archives. I got two research assistants and I ended up working in 27 different archives over three years to, to write this book. Uh, and what I found in this Klondike of records is that um, a lot of surprises, a lot of things I didn't know at least. Um, for instance, Moscow leaders said that, you know, right after the accident, um, they had, uh, that they had created this zone of alienation and that radioactivity was safely contained inside the Chernobyl zone. But what I found was deliberate exposures outside the Chernobyl zone. For instance, three days after the accident, there was a big storm front brewing that was heading northeast towards the big Russian cities, including Moscow. So they sent up uh, pilots to manipulate the weather so that radioactive fallout rained down on rural Belarus in order to save urban Russia. Now, that was probably an okay triage decision to make. 200,000 people lived down in that rural area. It spared uh, millions of people who lived in those big Russian cities. The only problem was they didn't tell anybody in Belarus that they had done this, not even the head of the Belarusian Communist Party. So what we find is here, down here on the, on the left, uh, down here where my arrow is, is bumping around, this is the Chernobyl plant and you see these angry red spots of high levels of radioactive contamination. The pilots flew over the big uh, city of Gomel and then let it rain here in this area here, nearly as hot as the Chernobyl area. Uh, people lived in this territory, uh, wasn't fully depopulated until 1999. It's basically a second Chernobyl zone that nobody really knows about. No, no journalists visit, uh, no disaster tourists wander around in there. Um, and that, that was a real major point of contamination for a lot of people. Another narrative is that the Soviet um, officials uh, tested the food and they found the food to be safe. Working through the Ministry of Agriculture records, I found vectors of contaminated food, especially in places where humans congregate. Uh, right after the accident, you know, uh, clouds of radioactive fallout passed over uh, cows and sheep and pigs in, in the fields. Uh, 100,000 head of livestock were contaminated and soldiers came in and killed these animals right after the accident. But then they didn't know what to do. They were loath to um, just throw away good meat in what was a pretty poor country at the time. So there's a, a manual, an instruction manual that went out to the meat packers and it said, grade the meat, low, medium, high levels of radio radiation in the meat, take the low and the medium levels, mix them with clean meat and make sausage. Send and label the sausage as you normally would, just don't distribute it to Moscow. Then they took the high level meat and they said, take that meat and shove it in a freezer and wait till it decays a bit. Pretty soon that Gomo meat packing plant, other meat packing plants in the area started to ask for more freezers. They keep asking for more freezers. They obviously don't get enough. And finally they find refrigerated train cars and shove high level radioactive meat in those train cars and send the meat, um, the, the cars to Baku. There the Geiger counters went off and they sent it on to Armenia. There they went off on and on and on. This radioactive ghost train circled the Soviet Union for four years until finally in 1990, the Ukrainian KGB buried the train inside the Chernobyl zone where it probably should have gone in the first place. Um, meat wasn't the only contaminated food produce. Uh, in the secret um, second Chernobyl zone um, in Belarus that I just showed you, three quarters of milk was over permissible levels in 1987. 22% of all mother's milk had higher than permissible levels of radioactivity. And, and I think that's just an astounding thing to try to think about, you know, how you get a permissible level of radioactivity for mother's milk. Um, I could also see that the typical map of, of radioactive fallout didn't make sense in terms of um, where people were getting sick. 
take this area right here, Chernigov. I found that there were um, a record saying that there were 200 liquidators working in this town of Chernigov in a wool factory. And I thought, that's strange. You know, these were female textile workers. I thought of liquidators as, you know, those were people who got, had documented exposures from helping up with the clean out, clean up. I, those are normally the firefighters, you know, fighting the radioactive uh, waves, not wool workers, female textile workers in a clean town 50 miles away from Chernobyl. So I worked through the archives, found out what I could, and then I drove up to Chernigov. And, and first I talked to the managers and they said, yeah, we had a problem in 1986 with, our, with dirty wool, uh, but we changed our process. A commission came from Moscow, we changed our process, problem solved. I asked to go down on the, on the line and, and talk to some of the workers. And, and I went down and I found of this list of 200 women, I found 10 were still there at their jobs. And uh, so I asked them, you know, then they, they look at my list and they're, oh, there's my name, there's my name. And I said, well, well where's everybody else? And they said, well, they've, they've died or, or they've been invalided out on pensions. Um, what were these women doing to get such an exposure? I found that they were, their job was to take dirty wool and sort it into different categories. And each day, many times a day, they picked up these big bales of wool that measured 3.2 micro rotengen an hour. That's like picking up an x-ray machine while it's turned on. Um, these women also said, yeah, you know, we were able to get the wool pretty clean with this new process, but what about the wastewater that left the plant? Did you ever ask where that went? And I said, no, where did it go? And they said it went into the town's drinking reservoir. I didn't believe that, but I went back to the archives and what these women who had no more than a high school education told me was absolutely correct. That water went, radioactive water, into the drinking reservoir. Now, officially, Soviet leaders said that they gave um, 900,000 people medical exams and they saw no change in health statistics. Uh, Moscow officials also said that they hospitalized uh, only 300, 300 people for uh, Chernobyl exposures. Um, and that's the official number we still have today, 300 hospitalizations. What I found working through uh, 27 archives is that not 300, but 40,000 people were hospitalized in the summer after the accident for Chernobyl exposures. 11,000 of these people were kids. Uh, records show that immediately after the accidents, doctors treated sick kids and sick adults. They recorded an increase in thyroid problems, complications at birth, birth defects, and infant mortality. Um, in 1987, in contaminated regions, half of the children had enlarged thyroids from radioactive iodine soaked up. Perinatal deaths, deaths within 28 days of birth, doubled in 1987 and tripled in 1988. Among adults, heart disease, enlarged thyroids, gastrointestinal and urinary tract disorders, cataracts, liver, blood disease, doubled and or tripled in between, um, doubled or tripled between 1986 and 1988. Cancer rates climbed in that second Chernobyl zone in Belarus, five times higher in that Mogilev province than Belarus as a whole. Um, finally, in 1989, leaders in Belarus and Ukraine declared they had a public health disaster on their hands. And, and here's um, two, um, uh, two patients who are post-op for thyroid cancer. You can see uh, the boy also has some growth hormone uh, problems. Um, here's a couple of visualizations that help you understand this accident. This um, record here says that they looked at 1,531 children in, in, in one county, and of those kids, 1,132 had one chronic disease or another. And, you, and I find that happens that um, from about 10 to 20 percent of kids before 1986 having a chronic health problem, that flips to 80 to 90 percent of kids in contaminated areas having chronic health problems. Uh, here's another visualization. This is uh, the levels of anemia, pernicious anemia among children aged four to six between 1986 and 1989. And this is just an arrow shooting off to infinity. Just the question of fatalities is difficult to answer. Uh, UN websites give numbers ranging from 33 to 54 people dead. 
Now, I, I find that number hard to believe as I travel around. Um, lots of people told me anecdotally, my mother died, my child died, my friends died, etc. Way more than 55 people. Um, in Ukraine alone, I found that 35,000 women received compensation uh, because their husbands died of a documented exposure from Chernobyl illnesses. That just as counts men, men who had um, not, you know, no women are in that count, no single people, no children, no people with undocumented exposures. Um, so I worked to sort out this confusing record. Who was right? Was there really a public health disaster involving 4.5 million people that we know next to nothing about? How could a story of that dimension slip beneath the radar? And while I was working the story, you know, the elections happened in the U.S. and the Wicked Leagues and the Russians possibly meddling in the U.S. election occurred. And, and I understand that information in the archives could have been planted there for me to find later. I understood that people lie, so archives lie. So I thought, how could I fact check this story? So I sought to locate sources that were more reliable, and I thought, what about the landscape? You know, trees don't lie. So I called a forester to give me a tour of the, and, and an understanding of the local ecology of the zone. And there's one thing to understand about the Chernobyl zone. Chernobyl uh, is right down in this corner here. And this greater area is, is Europe's largest marsh called the Pripyat Marshes. And um, it's an absolutely gorgeous area. It's, it's, a, it's a big sandy bowl transected by 17 rivers and breaks up into hundreds of ponds and lakes and streams. In the 1960s, Soviet hydrologists dried up most of the swamp to, for agriculture and to make room for Europe's largest projected nuclear power plant that's going to have 10 reactors. And as you know, reactors need a lot of water. So here's a, a picture of the Chernobyl plant. There was one area that was still very swampy though, and that's the, called the Omani Swamp in Southern Belarus. And the reason it was not dried up is because in 1960, Soviet generals turned it into a Air Force bombing range. So I asked a forester to give me a tour of this part of the swamp and, and we went in and we looked at a lot of spent ordnance and we saw the general's towers. And um, there had been about 10 villages in this uh, area before it was turned into a bombing range and they had uh, resettled these people, but there were still some remnants of these villages. So we went there and we saw this old cemetery. We're standing around and I, I take a look and there was this bomb crater and um, some pine trees growing out of the bomb crater. And, and I look a little closer and I, and I see these strange mutations on these needles of the pine trees. Um, pine needles are supposed to go, all grow straight in one direction. And when they do this, biologists call them disorganized. Now, uh, there are a couple of reasons why pine trees um, have mutations like this, but, but radiation is, is one major reason. I asked the forester, how old do you think this tree is? And he said, oh, about 40, 50 years. And I said, so, so it dates from before Chernobyl. And he said, yeah. And we looked around and, and we didn't see any other, um, there are other craters, but, but and we didn't see any other pine trees growing out of craters and we didn't see any other mutations. Um, and looking at that, this crooked pine tree, I was reminded of the persistence of radioactive contamination in this part of the world. Uh, and I placed a photo of it in, in, un, um, in a file I had of unverified accounts of the Soviets testing small strategic nuclear weapons in this bombing range in the 1960s. Um, I couldn't find archival confirmation of uh, that testing because those records are off limits to researchers. And, and that's the nature of power. They can make evidence go away if they so care to. But we have other evidence. And, and I was searching around and I found this very obscure study um, called um, Radioactive Cesium from Global Fallout that some uh, big team of, of Soviet scientists toured the pre-pit marshes for four years in the 1960s and did a study. They tested radioactive cesium in the soils, in the waters, in the plants, and in the bodies of people who lived near there. And they found that all the levels of cesium were elevated um, among people 10 to 30 times higher the levels of radioactive cesium than people who lived in Minsk and Kiev. And, and you see these dark spots. That's about where I was standing. These um, red spots here indicate high levels of radioactivity. Now, 
I want you to think about this. These, this map was created, this map that looks a lot like the Chernobyl maps of radiation I've been showing you. This map was created five years before they even broke ground on the Chernobyl plant. So more generally, touring the swamp, I realized that the perforations of radioactive isotopes into organisms of the swamp long predated the day of the Chernobyl explosions in April of 1986. And with that, I started to conceive of Chernobyl rather than a one-off accident, we might better think of it as an acceleration. The reason this is important is that because if you just see Chernobyl as an accident, then it has a clear beginning and ending. But seeing Chernobyl as a point of acceleration on a timeline, I began to visualize a much larger succession of events that are ongoing and in flux. And with it, a strange distortion of time. Physicists have been saying for 100 years that time, as we measure it in, in hours and years, is a human construct. That actually time expands and contracts in unpredictable ways. And, and Chernobyl it bears that out. Um, people and animals exposed to high levels of radioactivity experience a rapid radiation aging. For them, time speeds up. In the red forest that took the hardest hit of radiation right after the accident, um, time has slowed down. These trees, um, I, this photo was taken 25 years after the accident. Um, these trees, after the accident, the, the pine trees took such a hit of radioactivity that they turned red uh, and they died. And foresters came in and they, and they mowed the trees down and, and here they are. Um, if there had been enough microbes, and bugs, these trees would have decomposed within about 10 years, but here they are 25 years later. If Rumpelstiltskin had fallen asleep here and woken up 25 years later, he would not have been able to tell how much time had passed. So thinking about these issues, I called up the only two biologists I could find who have regularly worked in the zone for the last 20 years, and, and that's um, Tim Mousseau on the left and Andres Moeller. And um, they invited me along on their twice annual trips and I went along as a participant observer. I learned a lot from them. Now you most often hear in the media that uh, nature is thriving in the Chernobyl zone. Um, and that's a portrait created by journalists who make quick trips, flyby trips in, uh, into the zone. And their editors say, you know, get those pictures of the big fauna. And there are cages in the Chernobyl zone in case a photojournalist can't find any big fauna. I only saw one wild horse uh, since I've been going there in, since 2004. Um, but the biologist taught me that that nature is thriving story is just too simple. Uh, there is no singular zone of radioactivity in the Chernobyl zone. Uh, it's, a, it's a very much a mosaic where levels of radioactivity varies by four orders of magnitude. Um, the biologists taught me about the interconnections of the ecosystem. They documented in, in, radio, in highly radioactive air areas a decline in pollinators, which led to a loss of frugivores. With less fruit and fewer birds, seeds did not spread. They counted all of three trees, uh, fruit trees that had seeded after 1986. A whole cascade of extinction. Every rock we turn over, Musso said, we find damage. In two, 2017, while I was following them, uh, we went to the Red Forest. And, and I was hoping to avoid going to the Red Forest. Uh, it's not a very pretty forest. You can see here these crazy mutations uh, of this pine tree that was planted to grow board straight for uh, lumber for construction. You can see this pine tree isn't getting that message. And these pine trees are trying to become trees, but they only manage to be shrubs also because of mutations. And the ground cover in the lush Ukrainian forest there is very scarce. Uh, the birch trees are, are struggling to grow. But what really got me going is that my Geiger counter started screeching. I expected about 50 to 100 microsieverts an hour. That's already plenty, but it was, you know, going to end up almost to a thousand. And I asked the, the biologist, what's going on? And they said, oh yeah, about eight months ago, we had a forest fire here and it burned the, the leaf litter um, and that turned uh, volatilized radioactivity stored in the, in the leaf litter and in branches uh, into uh, radioactive ash and smoke. Um, now I checked, there was no media coverage. Uh, this was a pretty big event. It was a pretty big release of, of radioactivity. 
And those fires have occurred every year in the Chernobyl zone as Ukraine is getting hotter and drier. And, and this year the fires were so bad that they did reach the US media. And I think the problem this shows is that with the, with the long lives of, of radioactivity is the same with the long lives of chemical toxins. The time scales stretch beyond the capacity of social memory and human attention. If that crooked tree in the swamp shows how radiation predated Chernobyl, these forest fires show how radiation events occur long after the accident. And this ongoing quality plagued Soviet leaders. As much as they tried, they could not close the chapter on Chernobyl. In 1990, admitting that the biological load was too much, leaders in the Soviet Union announced plans to resettle 200,000 more people from the Chernobyl contaminated areas. But just as they made that announcement, the Soviet Union fell apart a year later and there was no money nor political organization to move people. And just as that happened, UN agencies came over, came, um, came over to manage the assessment of the disaster. And um, the Ukraine, Ukrainian and Belarusian leaders were going to the UN asking for a billion dollars in today's funds to do two things. One was to resettle these 200,000 people and another was to do a long-term health study on Chernobyl survivors because this is an interesting case of low doses of radiation, not high doses, um, like the one big x-ray calculated for, Chernobyl, uh, for Hiroshima survivors. But these IAEA experts, International Atomic Energy Agency, said, you know, there's no reason to remove any more people. There's no reason to do a health study because the doses these people are getting are too low compared to our studies in Hiroshima. Um, and so just as they said that, uh, the UN consequently voted down this grant this for $1 billion for a long-term study and to remove people. So as the post-Soviet economic crisis deepened, subsidies for clean food and mon medical monitoring withered. Residents were abandoned to their own fate on contaminated ground. And as most of them were farmers, they were just left to uh, eat what they produced. And I think we see this globally, and we certainly see it perhaps during this pandemic, that as more and more people live in environments that are saturated with toxins and pathogens, risk has been privatized. In one of the few studies of Chernobyl uh, birth defects, Vladimir Vitalecki of the University of South Alabama found um, six times higher rates of neurotuberculosis uh, disorders, that's like spinal bifida and anencephalic babies, than the European norm in northern Ukraine. He also found that his subjects had more radioactive cesium in their bodies than people in other parts of Ukraine. Now, this jump in birth defects could be from Chernobyl exposures. It could be from Chernobyl exposures and chemical pesticides and uh, fertilizers that are dumped on crops in this area. Or it could be from Chernobyl and pre-1986 Chernobyl exposures. My tour through the Pripyat marshes shows that these living laboratories are charred remnants pitted with the deposits of spent ammunition, heavy metals, chemical, and radioactive toxins that have distributed at a frenetic pace in the course of the 20th century. Now, you might hear this information and feel empathy for those people over there in Ukraine, a discrete part of the world. And, and that's when I was studying history in graduate school. That's how I was thought to think, uh, taught to think of history as um, something that plays out within national borders. Except now we have an awareness of the planetary scale of human actions. And that cognizance diminishes the importance of national boundaries. Those events out there, as with this present pandemic, make it home. So thinking about the nuclear timeline, a point of great acceleration came with nuclear tests uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Most countries tested nuclear weapons in other people's territories. The Soviets went to Kazakhstan, to the polar north. The British went to Australia and the South Pacific. The French went to Algeria and the South Pacific. But the Americans were different. We tested in the Marshall Islands nuclear bombs, but we also tested in the continental interior of the United States in the Nevada test site. 
Now, um, Chernobyl issued uh, radioactive iodine. It's really easy um, uh, radioactive isotope to count. It's very powerful. It affects the human thyroid, causes thyroid cancer, thyroid damage. Chernobyl issued 45 million curies of radioactive iodine. The Nevada test site issued 150 billion curies of radioactive iodine. Those, uh, that fallout, you might say, well, that was just Nevada out west. I'm not out west. But, but take a look at this map. This is a, the National Cancer Institute did a dose reconstruction in the 1990s. The brown spots are the hottest areas. And you see these, and the red and yellow are also hot. And you see this radioactive fallout um, skirting you know, the Rocky Mountains and heading with the trade winds uh, east and right in areas of high levels of precipitation here in the agricultural Midwest, where a good part of our food is produced, dumping down uh, levels of radioactivity as hot as at ground zero in Nevada. And here you also see in, in up in the um, Finger Lake regions of, of northern New York and little spots here in Tennessee. Um, now, in the 1990s, as the Chernobyl health problems were disclosed to the press, the big nuclear powers, the United States, Great Britain, France, and Russia, were faced with lawsuits. Thousands of atomic vets and downwinders filed suits claiming damage from their exposures to the Cold War testing and production of nuclear weapons. In 1987, a Department of Energy officials you know, spoke to health physicists and they said the biggest threat to nuclear power right now is not another nuclear accident like Three Mile Island or Chernobyl, but lawsuits. Um, and I found in the UN archives, and I worked through five UN archives, that a, 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 a few key officials at the International Atomic Energy Agency and the United, UN Scientific Committee for Atomic Effects, UNSCARE, lobbied to defund Chernobyl programs. They buried biopsies given to them of children from Chernobyl territories with cancers. Um, they dismissed studies showing other health problems that Soviet researchers were giving them. And I found that international scientists uh, devised a narrative that Chernobyl was the world's worst nuclear accident and only 33 people died. That was manageable. And this is where the accident narrative was useful. See Chernobyl as a one-off disaster and the liabilities, the costs of cleanup, the ongoing public health disaster dissolves. And that's indeed what happened. Nearly all the lawsuits failed. People around the world were left on their own. And so too there were their environments. And, and we know that, however, that long-lived radioactivity doesn't just go away. Traveling in, in northern Ukraine, in southern Belarus during those summers, I worked on this project. I found that thousands of people were harvesting wild blueberries from the swampy Pripyat marshes. And this was on an industrial scale. The young women and children would come out of the forest and they'd be met with a person with a van, a buyer, who would immediately buy, um, they, they buy or said they bought about two tons of berries a day. So my research assistant and I, we decided we'd go undercover berry picking. And, and here I am selling off my berries. And then we followed the buyers to the warehouse where they resold the berries to the warehouse. And there was this nice lady buying the berries. And, but before she bought the berries, she first measured them for radioactivity. I asked her, how many of these berries are radioactive? And she said, all the berries are radioactive, but some are really radioactive, like 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. The Ukrainian norm is 450 becquerels a kilogram. So that's pretty high. Um, we stood around and watched and um, found that, to my amazement, she bought all the berries. The, the, the cleaner berries she put to the left and the dirtier berries to the right. So I asked the pickers, you know, what are they going to do with these berries that are over the permissible levels? And the pickers told me, they said, it's like the sausage. You just mix the cleaner ones and the dirtier ones and you get to uh, an average that's below the European Union norm of 1,250 becquerels a kilogram. And then they're safe to go to Poland where they're processed for the global market. Now these berries I found looking through Homeland Security documents reach the United States, which also has a 1,250 becquerel kilogram uh, norm. And so now this accident is getting a little closer to our breakfast tables. Um, 
And if you ask a specialist in radiation medicine about those berries and your own exposures, they'll tell you not to worry that since the onset of nuclear testing in the 1950s, we all have some radioactive isotopes, man-made isotopes in our bodies. Um, and I think this point underlines what I have found, and that is that the Chernobyl accident serves as only an exclamation point in a chain of toxic exposures that have remastered our landscapes, societies, politics, and bodies, our bodies. I hope now when you take a look at this girl, uh, pick her with her blue lips from picking some and eating some, how she is not just a berry picker, but also a nuclear waste worker, picking up the toxic detritus left behind by others. She's very similar to these soldiers who cleaned up the accident. But maybe there's another way to think about this. Those berries, and later when they come back and pick mushrooms and cranberries later in the season, are doing what an army of Soviet and international scientists could not accomplish. They are cleaning radioactive isotopes from the soils. So rather than thinking of these berries as produce to be spread to spread the problem globally, we could see these berries as our allies. Pay these swamp dwellers $25 a day as they earn now to pick berries and deposit the berries in a radioactive waste dump. The uh, disaster tourists who visit the Chernobyl zone for their stag parties, they might be delighted to also pick radioactive berries, take the picture of them eating one with a selfie, and then they too would deposit them as radioactive waste. I think it just takes looking at our environmental problems without denials, with our eyes wide open, and then I think we can picture a brave new world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that incredibly interesting talk. I will now go ahead and switch into our moderated Q&A. Uh, thank you to everyone for your questions. Uh, the first question we have is pretty straightforward. Um, do you speak Ukrainian? Yes, I speak Russian. I, um, and Ukraine is a pretty interesting country. Uh, it's a bilingual country, so I, I understand Ukrainian. I've studied it. I, I've studied Polish. And I, so people would speak to me in Ukrainian. I would answer them in Russian. Uh, but there's also a dialect called uh, Polishchuk in northern Ukraine. Um, and that's a really special dialect that mixes Ukrainian and Russian and Polish. Um, and I, so I had a, a research assistant, and she helped me understand some of this Polishchuk. Wonderful. Uh, the second question is, what was your take on the HBO miniseries on Chernobyl that was recently released? Yeah, I enjoyed watching that show. It was very entertaining. Um, I got a lot of calls. Dozens of journalists called me to say, um, you know, it, was it true? It, was this history? Um, and I thought that was a funny question because it's a, it's a made-for-TV drama um, and, and it's fiction. But what was I, I found interesting about it is that the uh, Craig Mazin, the, the uh, writer, you know, he, he kept saying, you know, I, you know, this is, this is lies and this is truth. And, you know, this is a true story. And I worked really hard close to the sources. Um, but the sources that he had available to him in English were um, sources created by, by Soviet um, media. And about a month after the accident, uh, Gorbachev, um, uh, issued a circular that went out to the media that said, this is how we're going to handle the Chernobyl disaster. This is how we're going to handle it in the media. We're going to lionize the liquidators as you know, these people who altruistically risk their lives to save the world from a greater disaster. We're going to say, uh, talk about the accident is safely contained within the Chernobyl zone. Um, and we are going to um, uh, talk about the patriotism and, and selflessness of, of Soviet citizens in, in the face of disaster. And, um, and I think that's, you know, I, I think Mazin um, got, and, and then we're also going to create scapegoats who are gonna, we're going to blame on the disaster. And, and what I found was interesting about Mazin's um, depiction is he pretty much followed that Soviet line. Um, he gave us the Soviet, the Soviet version of events. Great. Uh, another question came in. Uh, so when you are approaching uh, interviewing a real person instead of your archives, uh, how is your approach different and are you often met with resistance uh, from people to share information with you? 
Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting that uh, Chernobyl, people who are residents of, of Chernobyl contaminated territories, and, and, and most of the Chernobyl contaminated territories uh, are inhabited. Um, they're tired. You know, I, I can see from the archives that 30 years ago, that's all anybody could talk about was Chernobyl, 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 Chernobyl. But, you know, now 30 years later, when I arrived in, say, 2016 or 17, people were like, oh, not Chernobyl again. You know, they're tired of being stigmatized as Chernobyl survivors, as Chernobyl mutants. Um, you know, one woman, um, she's like, oh, you, you know, you people come from out of the race, you're like Chernobyl, Chernobyl, but we don't have Chernobyl here. Um, but then she quickly switched and she started telling us about her um, two women's cancers she had had and the heart attack she had had at age of 45. And, and Olya and I, my research assistant, we, we, we didn't know what to say. We just sat there silently. And then she finally said, well, maybe we do have Chernobyl here, but it's our Chernobyl. Wow. Wow. Another question here, and this is two part, is uh, are you ever or were you when you um, were doing your studies uh, afraid for your own personal safety in your pursuits uh, and then also um, your personal health in your pursuits? I didn't love being in the in the red forest. Um, I, you know, I, I got used to being in the Chernobyl zone after, you know, we were often in, you know, it's a beautiful, you know, a lot of it's very beautiful forested areas and I, I enjoyed that. Um, I wasn't really that, you know, maybe I'm a little bit of a risk taker, but I wasn't really that concerned about my health because, um, well, I thought, you know, I've, I've already had children. I, I'm not, I'm, not uh, uh, I'm an older person. That gives, I have a lot of time for cancer to develop and, and I'm, you know, I might die of other things sooner. Um, and I thought, you know, somebody has to tell this story and, you know, somebody has to take a risk and, and people live there full time all the time. So um, I, I thought it was worth the risk. I, I wouldn't recommend going to the Chernobyl zone as a tourist. Um, that's probably not worth it. Sure. A uh, specific ca question came in about the fire. Uh, what type of radiation is higher after a fire, alpha or beta? No, that's a good question, um, and I'm not I'm not quite sure. Uh, you know what was coming out from those Geiger counters. There was definitely um, alpha, and, and the, the the counter was picking up alpha and beta. But um, uh, what's the real problem is that there's you know particles, and the closer you are to the 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 closer the fires are to the to the expired plant, the more plutonium is in the soils because plutonium is heavy and it landed closer to the reactor. And um, plutonium that sort of sticks, you know, little tiny isotopes of plutonium that stick to dust mites and, and ash and start floating away. You know, you breathe in a little, just a tiny particle, you breathe that in, it doesn't have to, you know, be terrifically hot. And that lodges in your lungs and it starts to decay. And um, it's, it's a, you know, plutonium in your lungs is a really serious toxic toxin. So I, I, that's part of the problem with, the, with these fires. Sure. Another question that came in is, um, what is being done, if anything, outside of individual researchers like yourself to prevent underreporting from officials um, both with previous disasters, but also um, in things that are happening today, such as COVID-19? Well, you know, it, you know, it takes, you know, science takes time and science takes effort. Um, and, and what I, what I really dislike hearing and, and, and during these, these, the spring, the fires in the, in the Chernobyl zone, uh, officials at the IEA rushed to say, and, and also um, some Ukrainian officials rushed to say, there's no problem. There's, the levels are too low. Don't worry about it. Um, but the problem is that they, they don't know that. Um, when, when leaders rush to give us assurances of safety before that anyone's gone to measure, um, there's no way of knowing as the fires burn, um, there's just little tiny pockets of radiation here and there, and, and you have to go measure. You could, the fires could burn um, across 50 acres, five acres could be very hot, the rest of the acres could be fine. And it's such a patchy mosaic that people who were saying there is no problem, um, people were saying anything, it was too early to know. Uh, the problem we have in Ukraine right now is that nobody was, was out to measure those fires. Uh, the firemen themselves had no protective equipment, they're just there in shirtless, uh, no respirators, um, you know, hacking away at the, at the forest. 
So um, we need to invest more money. We need to use, I, I know Trump just pulled out of the WHO yesterday, tr is trying to, um, but we need these international organizations as uh, in large part as watchdog organizations and we need them to be more effective and less politicized. Okay, another question that just came in. Given that US nuclear testing resulted in radiation spread of magnitudes greater than from Chernobyl, are rates of various diseases in the US measurably greater than in other parts of the world? Yeah, let me share my screen with you again and show you a slide. Um, and this slide will give us some Oh, no, sorry, this slide doesn't seem to be there. Um, I'm going to, sorry, I thought I had some more uh, slides in here that show this. We have phenomenal rates of, of cancer problems in the United States. Uh, cancer rates started climbing in 1950 and they continued to climb, um, especially now they're climbing among, among people who were born after 1952. Uh, gastric cancer is a big one. Thyroid cancer is a big one. Um, that are, you know, with gastric cl cancers climb uh, 6% in the last 10 years. So um, birth defects uh, have been, have taken over as the biggest um, killer of, of babies, perinatal deaths in the United States. And, and we see this, and the other really strange statistic is um, in the Northern Hemisphere where um, this radioactive fallout fallout circulated during the Cold War, uh, male uh, sperm counts have dropped in half since 1945. Now, these are just um, me uh, medical statistics. They're troubling. Yeah, and you can see if I, you know, if I had my charts with me, you could see these, these arrows going upwards. What we need to do is really study whether there's a correlation, um, you know, whether there's causation to this correlation and, and that we don't know. But we do have, some, we do have a troubling cancer epidemic amongst us that we don't talk much about. You know, we, we're, we're obsessed with the virus, uh, but we have other epidemics among us that we, we pay less attention to because they're slow. It's slow illness, slow epidemics. Um, but I think we should get more curious and, and, and ask our medical, to, uh, medical community to become more curious about these problems. That makes sense. Uh, this is a great question that just came in. Do you feel that you got to whatever the truth is or do you still have many questions yourself? And do you think there are important things that are still hidden and missing? There's a lot more to do. I was one person in 27 archives with, with two research assistants. Um, and we worked really hard for four years straight. Um, but there's so much more there. There's uh, information about uh, how animals fa fared, uh, wild animals and, and farm animals. There's information in those archives about uh, different, you know, different categories of children, um, uh, babies, pregnant women. Um, what I found was troubling, uh, uh, very alarming. Um, whether I'm right, I think more people need to go uh, and, and, and go into those archives and use those as, as a source. We, we don't have any r record like this. Uh, the Hiroshima studies, and Hiroshima is a very different nuclear event. It was, it's counted as one big x-ray uh, lasting less than, less than a millisecond. Um, Chernobyl exposures are a slow drip of, of low doses uh, that are internally ingested over decades. Um, but we don't have any good records like these Chernobyl records about the immediate after uh, effect of, of a big accident like this. Um, Hiroshima studies started in 1950. The explosion, of course, was in 45. Um, so there, we don't know in those first five years what happened to people, Hiroshima survivors. We don't know who, who died. We don't know who got sick, who, who had fertility problems, who had miscarriages. We have that, those records for the, for the Soviet case. And what we need are you know, epidemiologists to go in and, and really do that work. And the Lancet, uh, just a couple months ago, um, several doctors uh, made it, wrote an op-ed saying exactly that. We need to use uh, the Chernobyl records and go back and do a really serious study and find out once and for all what we've been wondering about for 50 years. What happens when people are chronically exposed to low doses of radioactivity in their environments? And that is much more of a scenario we're probably going to encounter than the Hiroshima. Let's hope to God we never have another Hiroshima, but we, we will probably have more nuclear accidents and spills and leaks. Sure. 
the next question that came in um, says, I graduated with a BS and an MS in nuclear engineering in 1986. Welcome, we're happy to have you, uh, as this was happening. The focus at the time was it can't happen here because of the terrible design of the Soviet RBMK reactors. Have you found resistance in the US and non-Soviet Europe to dealing with the after effects of Chernobyl because the West does not use anything similar to that design? Yeah, it can't happen here. Um, that was, uh, you know, a big, uh, you know, sort of we kept hearing that after the HBO show, it can't happen here, can't happen here. You know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, the, how did the Soviets get their nuclear technology that, through espionage? Uh, so the RBMK reactor is, is the same as the B reactor at Hanford. That was the, the first reactor to produce plutonium for World War II. Uh, and that reactor had a positive void coefficient. Uh, that so th it can happen here. Thank God it didn't happen here. But we had seven reactors that functioned into, until 1964 that were RBMK type reactors with a positive void coefficient. Um, we, you know, uh, there are re researchers are going back to the Three Mile Island event, and they're starting to see that it was probably more serious than we were told at the time. And the other thing, you know, that I think about when you know I hear that we, it can't happen here, I think to myself, but it already has happened here. We we had 150 million curies of radioactive iodine alone deposited across the United States in, in the 1950s from the Nevada test site. A on top of that, were added the test testings from um, atmospheric testing that the Soviets and the Americans and the and the French and the British were doing around the world. All that circulated around. Um, so I, I, no, I, I, I don't think um, that that kind of confidence um, makes much sense. And then after Fukushima, um, those were um, in part American built reactors. Um, and it doesn't look so great. Uh, speaking of Fukushima, a question just came in. Do you know whether ongoing studies around the Fukushima reactor meltdown are occurring? Do you see that as another similar incident or very different? The same two biologists I worked with, Mousseau and Moeller, uh, went right off in 2011, started to do, go twice a year to, to Fukushima too, and, and they found uh, very similar things among the, the plants and animals and insect life of Fukushima. Um, there have been doctors who've been working on the iodine uh, in relation to thyroid cancer. Um, several, uh, about 172, I think, kids have gotten thyroid cancer um, from much lower doses um, that they reportedly received. So there have been um, studies and, and there is medical monitoring around Fukushima. Sure. Another question we've received is, do you have any general advice for someone who is taking an approach to try to uncover the truth um, or you know, discover in more depth what has happened for a past event? Um, you know, archival records, uh, modern states, you leave a huge written trail. If you have the patience and the time to work through them, you can find a, a great deal of information. Um, I, I sort of go back and forth between working in archives and interviewing people. When I interview people, they tell me all kinds of things that help me point, you know, to, to take this mountain of records and, and, and make a more pinpointed study. So certainly we, we, can, get, um, we can get at the truth. Uh, we can get a, you know, a very close version of the truth. Of course, there's not one truth, but we can get uh, uncover um, things that have been kept in, the, in secret. Um, and uh, it just takes uh, some time. Uh, it takes for archives to be declassified and, and, and then we have at it. Sure. So here's a specific question that came in. In 1992, I was part of a mission to Belarus to work with health professionals and to visit the children from the hot zones. Are there records for those children now, many years later, and their current status. It really depends. Um, can, can that person say what what the program was? Was it the okay. part of the Was it the part of the NIH study? They can post that again into the Q and A, so we can find mm -hmm. out. Um, it really depends. Uh, you know what? One thing that happened that was really um, puzzling, uh, as I found, is that. Right in 1990, when the international uh, teams, of UN teams came in, um, four hard drives in, in different parts of the Soviet Union, Belarus and Ukraine and, and Russia, 
uh, were stolen, um, four computers were stolen with their hard drives and all the floppy disks, and those four computers held, computers were a very rare thing in the 1990 in the Soviet Union, uh, those four computers held all the dose data that they had taken of, um, of Soviet people who had been exposed to Chernobyl. So um, we do have some evidence that was clearly just destroyed. That was, I, I, my guess is that was a KGB operation to make sure that the Westerners didn't get at what I, I saw in the records, you know, that they're saying we have to make sure that the Westerners don't get our intellectual data. Um, but there, uh, there's an awful lot uh, I found in the Belarusian Academy of Sciences, um, some excellent studies, that case control studies. They started them secretly. They quietly started these studies in the summer of 1986, and they continued um, into the 1990s. Uh, they did a great deal of work, especially in Belarus, really um, super stuff that I, I think it'd be great if, uh, if there was some money to have that translate into English and, um, and have people work through that data again. We did just receive a follow-up that said, no, it was a part of a British and US effort, not a UN funded effort, largely NGO funded and institutionally. Yeah, um, that probably whatever that NGO was might have those records. I went, the first lab, and I write about this, all this is in my book, but I wrote, the first um, lab that, that was not Soviet to open up a Chernobyl a uh, clinic, children's clinic, and a lab in the Soviet Union was Greenpeace. And I worked through the Greenpeace archives to try to find exactly that kind of material. Do they have, what kind of health data do they have? And what I found, unfortunately, is that um, the KGB infiltrated Greenpeace and um, kind of sabotaged it from within so that they didn't really gather much information at all. Sort of a failed mission. Okay. And time for our last question that came in. Uh, where can we find out more about the work that you are doing and have done? Well, I have, um, a, you know, they're all in my books. Uh, Plutopia is a book about the first two cities in the world to produce plutonium, and, and those are big environmental disasters. Uh, that's called Plutopia, and then my book, Manual for Survival, you can just find them in any online bookstore, um, and you'll, you'll learn a lot more. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Professor Brown, for your time this afternoon. And thank you to all of our attendees for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you in some of our other great tech reunions presentations. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.